If you've ever booted a Linux workstation before, you've probably seen a lot of messages go by on the screen. There are splash screens and bootloaders. There's a lot of things going on when you boot up a Linux machine. What I'd like to do is take you through the process of the boot of a Linux operating system, and we're going to break it down into three different sections. The first one is going to be talking about the BIOS and how it's starting up. In the middle, we've got the bootloader itself. And lastly, we'll touch on how the kernel is used during the boot process. BIOS stands for Basic Input Output System. It is a core ROM, a read-only memory that's on the motherboard of your computer. When you start up your computer, it has no idea what to do. It is this ROM that is on your computer that is the first thing that runs whenever things start up. So this really isn't associated with Linux. It's used regardless of what operating system might be installed on the hard drive or in a storage that's on your computer. BIOS handles a number of important tasks. The first one is something called the POST. That stands for Power On Self Test. This is a quick test of memory. It checks to see that there are storage devices connected. It makes sure that there is a video display and does just a basic check of the fundamental hardware of your computer. This is not a comprehensive check. It's not going to check your USB ports. It's not going to go out and make sure that your printer configuration is plugged in properly. It's really checking for the most basic hardware you need to get the system started. The other thing your BIOS is used for is booting the operating system. It needs to get things going. The BIOS by itself can't get your operating system running. Inside of the BIOS is a list of devices that it will check in order to see if there is a master boot record on that device. The master boot record is a first sector of a disk that designates that it is a bootable device. And it will go down this list. In the list that I have here, it will check removable devices first. That might be a device like a floppy drive. It it will check the hard drive. If there's no master boot record on that, it goes to the next, which is the CD-ROM drive. If there's no master boot record, it goes to boot across the network from a network bootable device. So somewhere down the line, there should be a bootable device. If it gets through all of these and there's no master boot record, the system stops and the BIOS tells you, I'm sorry, there's nothing that I can boot from. Generally, we're setting this up so that we might boot from a CD-ROM first. We might put in a live CD. And if nothing's there, then we always fall back to the hard drive and boot from there. And we're going to go through that same process when we boot our Linux system in this video to see what happens during that process. Now that we are done with the BIOS, the BIOS hands everything off, the master boot record is run, and then the bootloader starts. The master boot record is not a lot of space on your disk. It's the first sector that's on that storage device. So generally, your bootloader is going to have some aspect of it in the MBR. But more often, there are also files and other parts of the bootloader that are also located on disk. At this point, the BIOS has finished what it needed to do. It has handed things off to the master boot record. The master boot record looks through its list and says, I need to start a bootloader, and it launches the bootloader. Now, you might not even see this. The bootloader may be configured to simply automatically launch the operating system. In many cases, though, a message, a series of menus pops up that gives you some options of how you can start the operating systems or perhaps run different operating systems that may be located on different drives or different partitions. One very common bootloader in Linux is Lilo. That stands for Linux Loader. One of the more common ones you'll see these days is Grub. That is the grand unified bootloader. There is also a task that takes place as the bootloader starts up where it might create a RAM disk. We call this the initRD image. initRD stands for initial RAM disk. That's because you may need to load different aspects of the operating system from a device that may be over the network. But you can't load up the drivers you need to use the network because you haven't started the operating system. So this is a nice middleman. It brings up just enough room in, in the RAM of your system to be able to load up some of these drivers and perform those basic tasks. If you've got an interactive bootloader, you've got some menus up. You can choose the type of options you'd like or the operating systems you would like to run. And you hit Enter. And now the bootloader begins starting up the kernel of the Linux operating system. If you wanted to see where the kernel was actually located, once your system starts up, you can go to the boot directory. And it starts with VM Linux. You can see the Z on the end. And that designates that that particular image of Linux kernel is compressed. One of the first things that happens 
happens is it uncompresses itself. There are some builds of Linux where it's not compressed, but most of the time you'll find it compressed in that directory. This initially gets the hardware running. It runs a command called Linux RC. That stands for Linux Run Command. That's going to begin the process of looking at your system, loading up hardware drivers, getting the disk online, getting your PCI bus going, making sure your processes are running, and getting all of the hardware so that you can then start loading drivers. This is also the time where that initial RAM disk that was set up by your bootloader can go away. We've got our real disk now. We don't need the RAM disk anymore, so that's unloaded. We don't have to worry about having that online any longer. And finally, now that all of our drivers are loaded, we're communicating with all of the hardware, we can actually load the file system and provide you with a login prompt and have you access the operating system itself. So there's your three-step process. We go from the BIOS to the bootloader and finally to the kernel. Let's run this and see what it looks like in action. When you first start your system, the BIOS starts up. And in this particular case, I've stopped the BIOS so that you can see this screen and exactly what you might see. Normally, it flashes for a moment, and it's gone. You can see in this view that there is the Phoenix BIOS that's listed. It even lists out the RAM that it has found inside of this system. It tells you that there is a CD-ROM drive. There's a mouse. It is checked for a keyboard. It obviously can see the video. So at this point, it has everything you need to get things running. There's also some options across the bottom we can press. F2 to enter our setup configuration. We can boot from the network with F12. Or if you would like to decide in what order you would like to boot these devices, you can press the Escape key, and it will bring up a list of devices that you can choose which one you'd like to boot from. You can make a lot of BIOS changes in here, and we'll do another video where we step through how you would enable or disable some of these features so that you can turn them on and off inside of your Linux operating system. We're going to choose our hard drive to boot from, and at that point, our bootloader appears on the screen. This is the bootloader for OpenSUSE. I've got a desktop configuration here, a text only. There's a fail safe option you can go to. If all else fails, your normal configuration isn't starting up. You even have a floppy configuration that you can start up in this view. Let's do the desktop configuration so you can see what happens. I'll press Enter. The screen brings up these splash screens. A lot of the details of the Linux startup process are hidden from us because of the splash screens that are there. And it prompts me for my login, and I can give it my username and password. And now I'm logged into the system. The moment we hit Enter on that bootloader, it began the process of loading the kernel and getting us to the operating system view that we have right here. Let's go and view a text-only view so that you have a perspective of what's really going on behind the scenes. I've shut down my operating system. I've started up this operating system again. We're at the BIOS prompt. Now let's step through the same process we did before. But instead of choosing the desktop option, I'm going to choose the text only option. So as soon as I choose this, that's where our kernel process begins. And because I've turned off all the splash screens, you can see all of the information that's coming through. I've even turned on a special verbose mode. So we're really looking at a lot of detail. Now, even the most seasoned Linux professional who's administering many Linux machines can't possibly know what every single one of these things are. You have a pretty good idea. And you do want to become a bit familiar with the process. But one of the nice things is that if you ever find something that's a little bit different than the normal boot process, Process, you can do more research at that point. Because of the way that I've loaded this up, it even goes through a process where it's now looking for network connections. And once it gets to that point, we finally load up our network drivers, and we're at a login prompt. So that's the process. We've now started our computer. We've had the BIOS load. We've been able to see the bootloader and all of the options inside of it. And we've started the kernel from there and had our Linux operating system load through the entire boot process.